very attractive spring wildflower. Uh, called trout lilies. Or you sometimes see dog tooth violet, but that's a total misnomer because it has nothing to do with violets. It's in a lily family. With parallel veined leaves and six parted flowers. And you can find these sometimes in very great abundance, carpeting the ground. If they've been established for a while. There were none of these here when I moved here, so uh, these are just just patches just forming up over about 10 years of just some little plants I brought home and I've just been letting them spread. It's starting to get kind of thick here and there. There's a nice bunch of them back here on this slope. So I could increase these a lot faster by digging them up and spreading the roots around. And the main thing I want to talk about is that they're good to eat. So some people like to eat the leaves in the springtime. It's a little late for that. You want to eat the leaves when they're first sticking up and they're still folded in half before they open out like they've done here. These will make seeds. Uh, the problem is by the time that they make their seed capsule, everything else has disappeared. And a lot of other stuff is coming up because they're always in a rich area. It's not like when they disappear, it's going to be empty. By no means. There's plenty of other stuff down there that just hasn't come up yet. So, so the bulb is the best part to eat. So let's see if we can find a couple of bulbs. These are difficult to harvest because the little tiny tubers are often uh, six inches deep or more than that. So that's the problem is getting down deep enough in this whole matrix of whatever's there, rocks and boots and everything. So let's see what we got in here. All kinds of roots. So this is the stuff that's going to be coming up after these are gone. That's a nice big Solomon seal root. This looks like that crinkle root, which is mustard family. We call it American wasabi. It's a very strong wasabi type flavor. There's a little baby. <laughs> Sorry. We got one. One all that deep. So there it is. As I started to say, these will make seeds, but by the time they make the seeds, everything's going to be gone. You can see there's already the beginnings of the little capsule. Uh, but what I've done in the past, if for some reason you want to get a bunch of seeds, is you can find these tiny little Ziploc bags and put them over and seal them and then go back in about a month and you'll be able to find the little Ziploc bags because they're shiny. And you'll get the seeds out and they, they're quite good about germinating from seed. Just plant them right away, let them go through the winter. So this is a decent sized bulb. These are extremely tasty. I have read that uh, there are bigger ones out west called glacier lilies and other things like that. And then it's international. So there's a European Asian one called Dens Canis, dog tooth. Erythronium is their genus. And I have read that those are very high class luxury food in Japan. I think they make flour out of them and do things with them. But I don't have the reference with me right now. Gotta find something online. So, if you wanted to increase them, uh, this would be how you'd do it look for a big patch of them somewhere. Take up a forkful and get some and, and just scatter them around, plant them here and there, and wherever you plant one, in five years or so, there'll be a little circle of them. They're pretty good about increasing them that rate. 
But you can see as a food plant, it would be kind of a slow process. <laughs> I think uh, Samuel Thayer has a lot to say about this and all other wild food plants. Like he said, he can get a half a cup an, an hour or something like that. But it's his, one of his very favorite wild foods. It's what he wanted to have on his birthday was sauteed uh, trout lily bulbs and spring beauty bulbs and ramps. And all this spring stuff really is some of the best food you're going to get all year. It's totally loaded with chi from a Chinese perspective. This is all, it just kind of embodies the spring energy. Yeah, they're pulling out of here fairly nicely. So, one way I have found, the only way I have found, is you can harvest a bunch of these pretty conveniently, is that if you get into the areas where they're growing, it seems to favor moisture. You won't look for it on a really dry ridge, I don't think. Near streams, So you're in the woods wandering around looking for, typically we're up there looking for ramps, but finding all this other cool stuff. Uh, sometimes you will come across great big boulders that have been sitting there for a while and they've accumulated a layer of soil on top. If they're more or less flat, I mean big boulders, so maybe not as big as the yurt, but half as big as the yurt. And there's a whole variety of things growing there on top of that rock. You might six or eight inches of soil that's accumulated over the eons from rotting vegetables. I started off just being moss, you know, and then that rotted down. Anyway, you can grab these and pull it back. And there's all your roots. You can just pick out all these edible roots and put it back which seems like a really, and my long-term goal is to set something up like that. You know, I don't know what to use underneath. I'm kind of going back and forth. Do I really want to use galvanized tin? No, probably not. Like, do I want to use some plastic roofing? Well, maybe, uh, but something or other, to, and then put about six inches of top-notch leaf mold and so on on top and plant all these spring ephemerals in that. And they could be harvested on a rotating basis every few years because you're just going to pick out the big bulbs, leave all the little ones in there. So that's trout lilies. There's another one. Erythronium americana. Uh, Thayer, I forget which of his three books it's in, but if you're really interested, you want to read up. He talks about the difference in the flavor of these bulbs, depending on whether you get them in the spring. And he thinks the best time to get them was when they're first appearing in the spring. That's when they have the maximum amount of sugar. Then as they go dormant and go into storage for the winter, the sugar converts to starch. And so in winter time or the dormant season, they're, I'm not gonna get that one. They're, uh, they're much starchier tasting. They're also still, I think, pretty nice, but they're different. They're not sweet like the springtime ones. And that's probably true of most of these spring ephemerals. The part about them having a lot of sugar in the springtime and then being more starchy later in the year. Here's one. They can be quite deep, as I said. So there's enough little seedlings in there that I expect by next spring this will look exactly the way it did last spring. So I have tried to get a hold of these foreign ones, particularly Erythronium densconus that's sold a lot by the, the higher class bulb dealers. 
I must say they've, they've been proven a little difficult. I finally got a couple of them established. They come in all kinds of nice colors and they're definitely showier. And then there's a big hybrid on the market. Erythronium Pagoda is one. That's with yellow flowers. I forget the name of the other one. And I'm looking forward to uh, digging those up and seeing what kind of bulbs they actually have. Whether they're an improvement as far as an edible wild food or not. They're sold primarily as a, as a flowering bulb. So this is the hybrid one. And you can kind of see it's still got that uh, sort of blotchy leaf like the regular one had with the sort of purple spots on it. Like this. So that's the native species. This is this hybrid between who knows what and what. As I said, there's a number of species around the world of erythrotary. Obviously doing a good job of increasing. This was just a single one, I think three or four years ago. Now they're forming up into nice clumps. They haven't bloomed yet. But presumably they're gonna. Well, now that is a very substantial bulb. Of course, it's several years old, but you know, the idea of, of just naturalizing these things, sticking them out. And I haven't tried them just totally in the woods. I've put them into beds where I could keep an eye on them. But obviously, these clumps can be divided. It's typical with anything with a bulbous root is that it makes, in addition to seeds, they make offsets. So that's what these are going to be, and this would be a a way that you could propagate them. Look at these. So this would be a new plant and a new plant and a new plant. And I'm kind of keen to wash this off and see what it tastes like. I'm prepared to be disappointed, but optimistic. And I have sampled it and it's quite good. It's very, this one seems to be in the process of dividing like garlic into separate cloves. Extremely uh, crunchy, I don't know if you can hear. Very tender, like a apple, sweet. I'm kind of waiting for the aftertaste to kick in. Um, maybe a slight after bitterness, but really pretty insignificant. I think this would be an excellent addition to a wild food garden. Yeah.